dissociative identity disorder. Or, well, they used to call it multiple personalities, right? Back in the 70s, wasn't there a movie that was out, Sybil? If you remember that, I see a lot of people nodding their heads. Some young people have to say, I have no idea what you're talking about. But it was a, it was a woman who was gripped with multiple personalities that uh, different parts of herself that came into play when she was afraid or when something happened as a way of defending herself, her psyche, her inner being from things that she did not want to face or was unable to face. And part of us have these things but not such, to such a degree. For instance, if you come upon a situation that's an emergency and, and all of a sudden you, you take action and you take care of the situation or you're part of it and then later on you say, how did I do that? How did, how did that happen? I'm not normally like that, but something took over. It, or, or something else happens in your life and, and another part of you kicks in that you didn't know you had. For those introverts who stand up in front of a crowd and talk, how does that work? That's not my normal personality. That's not my normal state of being, but these different things happen and occur. Jesus encountered such a man who... We, he, he possessed many number of, of things going on in his mind. At that time, they called them demons. And they could very well have been demons. I don't know. But he had a way of, of sifting through like the animals. You know, it's not a hippo. It's not, a, it's not an orangutan. It's not a gorilla. It's, let's get to the core. Let's get to the heart of the person and give them some peace of mind. And if you notice at the end of the story, the one who was unafraid was the man who Jesus came upon and freed him from all of his demons. And the rest who knew not Jesus were afraid. But this man was at peace because it finally had revealed to himself his true identity, his true self. This is who he really is. Now, I, I can't help think about these poor swine herds. You know, as you ra if anybody raises animals, you know, let's say you've got a number of, a herd of cattle or a herd of swine, and you're out there, and all of a sudden, there you go, there goes your life, save, you know, your life right there, just off the mountains. Interesting. Of course, we know that pigs are not stupid, right? One of the smartest animals on the farm. I know from experience, I had a pet about 800 pounds. Her name was Harriet. I had her for about four years, and she was my pet. And she would get out of her pen. And we'd go, I'd go out to the back, and we had a back porch without a door. It's kind of exposed to the outside. And in the morning, I went to go feed and water Harriet. And so I'd open the back door, and there she was, right in front of the door. She got out of her pen. No matter how hard I tried to keep her in that pen, she would seem to get out. And so I, I can't see pigs just loading off a cliff by themselves. It just doesn't seem possible to me. They're smarter than that. Something really basic or deeper must be going on here. And certainly there was. Jesus was trying to get to the heart of the matter, like He always does when He heals people. Sometimes it's not, you know, uh, you're healed. Sometimes it's your faith has made you well, stand up. It's to the heart of the matter. It's a deep, something deeper than we sometimes allow ourselves to see or feel. Sometimes other people can see it and we can't. Sometimes we're blinded by our I don't know what. But Jesus takes this, this, this man and his initial feeling is to stay where this healing took place. This man who showed him so much compassion when others tried to enslave him, put chains on him, and, and, and put him outside the city so that he wouldn't bother anybody and have no friends, no family. So this man naturally gravitated toward this Jesus who, who healed him, who's, who got to his heart and, and helped him out and befriended him. It's natural for us to, to go where we're feeling comfortable and warm and loved. 
But Jesus says, no, I know you want to stay here, but you need to go out into the city and proclaim what has been done for you. That's kind of like we do here on Sunday mornings. We come to a place of hopefully healing and feel the spirit of the word and, and think about it and be in the presence of God in a in more intimate way with our friends and our families. Not to be here all week, every day of the week. We don't live here. But we come here for regeneration. We come here to praise. We come here to worship. And then we go out into the world strengthened with the Holy Spirit, with the knowledge that we're not alone. Jesus sent the, 20, the 70 out. He didn't send them alone. He sent them in pairs that they might strengthen and encourage each other. And that's what we do. We're not alone in this. Weeks ago, we talked about the advocate that Jesus said, I'll never leave you. I'll leave you an advocate that will always be with you, no matter what. So Jesus takes this very seriously. Getting to the heart of the matter building up, getting ready, and sending out. And can you imagine this man's witness to the world? That he's going back as a changed person who was at peace, who knew the healing power of Christ's presence in his life. We know from experience that if we've endured something, it gives us that much more clout to share with others what we've been through because if we're going through the same thing they're going through, they understand. We understand what's been going on. That's the beauty of being healed. That's the beauty also of being wounded. All of us are, both and. We come here for healing in our woundedness. Sometimes we're afraid because I don't, I'm not really feeling good today so I'm not going to church or whatever. And you, you don't take advantage of that sense of community. We pray for the Klugs, we pray for the Bartels, we pray for those whose uh, family members or friends are sick or in pain or with Alzheimer's or, or whatever the case may be. Because we know that this is where Christ assembles with us and sends us into the world. And no matter what we do, my position as a pastor is no more greater than anybody else's here in the sitting in this congregation. Jesus uses us as he does. And he continues to, to help us. And maybe I need to turn my mic up a little louder so that I can hear myself talk. So, on this journey of our faith, we can imagine ourselves sometimes as, as this garrison demonic. All these things going through our mind at once. Where do we start? Where do we end? Who are we really? We look in the mirror. Who am I? And there it stands back in our face, that question mark. Yes, who's, who, who are we? And if there's doubts, we come back to the congregation. We come back to what the Holy Spirit is with us and says, you are a child of God. You are baptized, clothed with Christ forever. You're clothed with all the rest of those who have gone before us in their baptisms, united. And Paul speaks about the unity in that. When we think that we're Norwegian or we're German or we're American or we're whatever, that we boil away all those identities and we know that we're one in Christ. Because we took on that, that gown that's been in the family for generations. Standing in the front of the church, being baptized with water and oil and words and love from the people of the community. Embracing Kara as, and all of us as God's own child. We live in that faith that God will never abandon us, will heal us and continue to heal us. And give us hope that nothing is too great. This demonic, I'm sure, this man of demons, I'm sure, lost faith, lost hope. And now he's a changed person. And that's what God does for us. He gives us new life as changed people. Amen.